Humans show remarkable performance recognizing objects in complex environments. For example, you can easily tell that this picture has a man and a dog, even though both of them are only partially visible. This type of challenging task is solved by the ventral visual stream. This stream contains a series of brain areas, and these areas work hierarchically to convert raw pixel inputs into useful visual abstractions, such as object categories. Recently, researchers have made much progress in understanding the vis ventral visual stream using task-optimized deep neural networks. Specifically, they found that the networks trained on visual object recognition can accurately predict neural responses in brain areas, including the upstream area V1, intermediate area V4, and the downstream area IT. Their neural predicting performance um, surpasses all other models, even though these networks have never seen neural data during their training. So it sounds like we are at the end of this story. Should we just start our vacations with the conclusion that task-optimized networks are equal to ventral visual stream? Sadly, the answer is a huge no. The biggest problem in this model is that the task used in training these networks is large-scale object categorization task. And this task is simply biologically impossible. More specifically, these networks are all trained using ImageNet, which contains 1.2 million labels. There is just no way that infants or primates can get millions of labels during their development, which makes these networks incorrect models for visual development. In this talk, we aim to address this problem through building better neural network models for visual development using tasks requiring no or significantly less labels. The takeaways are that we successfully identified a class of label-free tasks, namely self-supervised tasks, that lead to networks with good V4 and IT predictivity. Moreover, we further trained the networks with semi-supervised tasks and improved their similarities to human and primate behaviors. Taken together, we propose a network training curriculum that can serve as a model of visual cortex development. At the beginning, I will first provide a brief overview of um, self-supervised tasks in terms of whether the networks trained for these tasks are useful for other downstream tasks or predicting neural responses. The, categor the categorization task listed here has proven to achieve high neural predictivity to area V4, uh, V1, and IT, despite the fact that it's biologically impossible. The networks trained are also useful for other tasks, um, such as identifying scene categories and the depth normal prediction. As for self-supervised tasks, I will start from autoencoder, which is potentially more familiar to people here. This task trains an encoder to um, generate a compressed representation that is later used to reconstruct the original input through a decoder. Because this task is relatively easy to accomplish, people have found that additional penalty needs to be applied to the compressed representation so that the model can avoid trivial solutions. With the sparsity constraint, we then get the sparse coding algorithm, which gives a rise to these nice Gabor-like filters. With a probabilistic um, formulation and a distributional um, constraint on the hidden vectors, we then get variational autoencoder. Generative um, adversarial networks are also related to autoencoders, but different from them, as they have uh, replaced the reconstruction loss with another network, um, detecting whether the reconstructed image is a good example of the input distribution or not. All these tasks within the autoencoding framework um, are generally weak, so that the training requires a lot of extra con constraints um, to fight against the trivial solutions. Um, this makes the trained networks not strong enough to support other tasks. Therefore, they might have good V1 predictivity, as they show filters similar to Gabo's, um, but not V4 IT predictivity. <coughs> Next, I will describe the self-supervised tasks that, we, uh, that are more recently proposed. Um, I will show how they train the networks and then examine their performance in both neural, uh, visual tasks and uh, neural predicting uh, tasks. I will also briefly talk about how they can be practically implemented during development, but I choose to focus more um, on how similar these networks are to brains. 
And this neural predictivity check can quickly filter out most of the self-supervised tasks and give a significantly shorter list of, um, for later biological um, plausibility check. So let's begin from a class of self-supervised tasks, which I call sing single image statistic tasks. This task first extracts some information from the original input, and then asks the naturals to infer the extracted information from the remained partial data. So the naturals are effectively trained to di discover the relations of different statistics within the same image. One example in this task uh, is this task called um, relative position. This task first samples two patches from adjacent locations of a grid of an image and then asks the network to predict the, their relative position. Um, for biological implementations, you can imagine that the two patches um, are the images before and after SCART. Um, the label predicted is then similar to the direction of the SCART which is available to humans. Another example within this class is this correlation task, which is also mentioned in the last um, contributor talk. It simply gives the network um, a grayscale image and then trains it to predict the corresponding color map. This task can also be implicitly performed by humans when the outputs from shape perception neurons are matched um, to the outputs from color perception neurons. And a third example is depth prediction, um, which is predicting depth information from the RGB information. Although this task is usually not recognized as a self-supervised task, it can be practically performed by a visual cortex as depth information is available in other pathways. To test how useful the learned features from this task are, um, we use a pipeline that is widely used um, in AI researchers. More specifically, we first train on AlexNet using the self-supervised tasks um, on ImageNet, and then we fix the trained weights, uh, add an additional classifier, um, and only train that classifier for ImageNet cat categorization um, using features extracted from different layers. So we first show the performance of the untrained networks and the categorization trained networks as the lower bound and the upper bound for this performance. Relative position and correlation tasks are both much better than the untrained uh, networks, but are still significantly worse than the categorization networks. We don't show depth um, prediction result here because this task can only be trained on synthetic data sets with depth information available. As for the neural fitting comparison across these tasks, we choose ResNet 18 as the visual backbones, not only because this uh, architecture is more advanced and recent than AlexNet, but also due to its anatomical similarity to visual uh, cortex, given that its number of layers uh, is similar to that of visual cortex, uh, considering, the number, uh, considering the needed time of a forward pass. The neural data we used to test these tasks was from James DeCarlo's lab, which was collected by presenting two macaques um, with various images containing different objects under uh, irrelevant and highly uh, variant backgrounds. The images were on for 100 milliseconds. We take the average responses between 70 to 170 milliseconds after image onset for V4 and IT neurons. We present the same images to the artificial neural networks and use their outputs from each layer to predict neural responses of different areas through a linear regression. Um, we calculate the Pearson correlation um, of predicted and ground truth responses on held out validation images and the reports the median um, of the correlations across neurons within one area for one layer. We then report the maximum neural prediction number across all layers. The results shown here indicate that these tasks um, all achieve significantly better uh, neural predictivity than an untrained uh, network. Although they are all worse um, than categorization tasks in both areas, um, the gap of V4 seems to be smaller than that of IT. Com coming back to this table, um, these tasks seem to have okay performance on V4. Um, they may have okay V1 predictivity as their early layers filters are also similar to Gabor filters. However, their IT predictivity and the usefulness for other tasks are not so good. To further increase the IT predictivity, we recall the conclusion from task optimizer networks. That is, if the networks are better at categorization tasks, they will also be more uh, similar to visual cortex. Therefore, we just need to develop or find stronger self-supervised tasks. 
Luckily, AI researchers have been working very hard in this domain too. And I think last year, um, there have been a new class of tasks which achieve much better performance than the single image statistic tasks introduced earlier. All these tasks have the similarity that um, their objective functions are defined on the distribution of all imager embeddings, which is why I named them as multi-image distribution tasks. One example task within this class is deep cluster. Um, this task applies an unsupervised clustering algorithm to group all the embeddings into small clusters. Um, then deep cluster further trains the network uh, to predict the assigned cluster label. Um, these two steps are iterated uh, to get to the final network. Another example in this class um, is instance recognition task. This task optimizes the image representations. So that's the representations of two instances of the same image as shown in the bottom here, um, will be similar when they, while the representations are also optimized so that they are different from the representations for all other images. This loss is effectively optimizing the ability of the network to correctly memorize and recall the same image. Inspired by these two tasks, we introduced local aggregation. This task optimizes representation space so that an image will be encouraged to be closer uh, to uh, smaller background neighbors and, uh, and, uh, and uh, at the same time be encouraged to be farther from a bigger neighborhood. This task can be effectively viewed as a conceptual combination of deep cluster and instance recognition as it encourages both aggregation and separation. Unfortunately, we don't have time to share more details of this task, but our paper has been accepted to ICCV 2019 as an oral presentation when we will provide more information and the codes and the paper are also public now. Using the shared um, standard ImageNet uh, transfer learning benchmark, we can see that local aggregation greatly surpasses other tasks and further approaches um, the categorization models. This performance improvement of local aggregation over other tasks is even bigger for deeper architectures such as ResNet 18 and ResNet 50. Moreover, our unsupervised ResNet 50 performance has already surpassed that of the milestone AlexNet trained with all, uh, trained with all ImageNet labels. We also need to mention that this achievement has also been reported in other concurrent or later works in, in two hour works. So as, indi uh, as indicated by their effectiveness in downstream task, um, these three tasks indeed also show high neural predictivity, especially local aggregation task shows performance that is very close or even slightly better um, than the categorization task. Moreover, the trained network by local aggregation also shows correct an atomic map to different areas. As shown in this plot, um, the V4 predictivity of this network peaks at an intermediate layer and its IT predictivity peaks at a higher layer. This nice anatomical map can also be shown in this figure. So going back to this table, it seems that the local aggregation is really about to end this story as it has strong categorization performance and also very good visual cortex predictivity. So it seems that we have got what we want, a network trained using self-supervised task can, accurate, can accurately predict V4 and IT new responses. Let's ask ourselves the, this question again. Is LA trained network now actually equal to a um, venture visual stream? Okay, I guess you know the answer is of course another no. But before giving that answer, we first introduce a new metric which is proposed by colleagues in Jim DiCarlo's lab to measure the behavior similarities between models and human primates. This metric is collected through asking subjects to correctly categorize um, objects with destructors presented. The same images and the destructors are then presented to the artificial neural networks. The researchers correct the image times destructor category error pattern metrics and compute their correlation or consistency to human error patterns. This metric has been found strong enough to separate bad models, uh, okay models, to great models. Using this metric, we can see that LA networks are still significantly different from networks trained with uh, categorization tasks. Here, a higher number means more similar to human primates. To bridge this gap, we propose to use the fact that infants do get some labels during their development. Therefore, we propose a learning curriculum which develops the model using self-supervised task first and then change to semi-supervised task to make use of both labeled and unlabeled images. 
Um, inspired by the progress in self-supervised learning algorithms, we introduced local label propagation. Similar to the multi-image distribution task, um, this task also uses the embedding space. Using this space, it infers the pseudo-labels of the unlabeled images um, through considering the local geometric uh, properties of the space. The network is then optimized to predict um, the pseudo-labels as well as aggregating the images with the same pseudo-labels together in the embedding space. To make the whole curriculum biologically possible, we only allow the semi-supervised learning algorithms um, to use 3% of image labels in ImageNet, meaning 30,000 labels. In addition to local label propagation, we also show the results from another state-of-the-art algorithm, um, meaning mean teacher as a comparison. Both of these two networks successfully improve the behavior similarity of the self-supervised network, um, significantly bridging the gap to the supervised network, which uses 1.2 million labels. And another baseline, if we only allow the categorization task to have 3% labeled image nets, images, it can only achieve a very low behavior consistency. This comparison supports the effectiveness of the semi-supervised learning tasks in using the unlabeled images. In conclusion, um, this work proposes a network training curriculum for modeling visual developments. There are still other problems we haven't yet uh, addressed in this curriculum. One problem is that the difference between ImageNet, the data set we're currently using, and the stimuli that infants are actually getting. For example, ImageNet contains static images, while infants see continuous flows of uh, images with temporal uh, correlations. We have started addressing this problem through developing self-supervised algorithms for videos. Please check our archive paper if you have interest in that. Another future work is to do the trajectory comparison for our curriculum, meaning that we compare the intermediate points of our training, uh, model training trajectory to the corresponding points of infant developmental trajectory. Ultimately, we expect that our curriculum produces a correct final model and also generates a correct intermediate points. At last, I would like to thank my cooperators, Simin and Aram, my advisor Dying, and the colleagues in our snail lab. And thank you all for your attention. We'll take questions while the next speaker approaches and gets ready. Hi. Mm -hmm. Thanks for the interesting talk. Uh, so I get the argument for semi-supervised learning in human children, but how does that work for non-human primates? They're not that's getting a, any labels at all, right? Un unless right. you count during the experimental training. Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, we indeed have not uh, uh, addressed this question that primates do not get labels during their usual developments. Yeah. It's possible that to get the big behavior consistent, so um, the, the, the people in Degaro's lab have shown that primates do behave similarly in categorizing objects, but that requires a large amount of experimental training. So it's either possible that this phase of training is helping the shaping the uh, 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 representation so that they will be similar, or there are other, like, we, if we propose stronger self-supervised networks, mm -hmm. our representations will also be similar in the behaviors. So the strong claim of that would be if you could look at the representations early during the experimental training, then exactly. you, you yeah. should, it should look more like pure um, right. self-supervised learning. Right, no right. Labels. That's, that's a very good test that we can do to test this hypothesis of whether this sh experimental training is shaping the representations. Uh, thank you for your presentation. But now, so I would like to understand how the, the visual stream in the primate brain really works. And mm -hmm. for that, we should also look at the hardware, right? And we know that um, within any cortical volume, only 3% of the synapses come from outside that volume. This for instance, work from Kevin Martin. And we also know that the projections um, that are within that volume drop off with an exponential decay. That's work of Henry Kennedy with, let's say, a max distance of about a millimeter. So if we now start to impose these anatomical constraints on these kinds of models, what will happen to their performance? Okay, um, that's a good question. We have not uh, very well addressed these anatomical constraints um, in our models, and I would like to uh, uh, learn how these constraints will actually like be practically applied to our model and the whether they, after applying these constraints, um, our model will behave more similarly to the uh, primates, for example. Um, but that's definitely one of our future direction. But then we should be careful calling it ventral stream, right? Then it is. <laughs> uh, these are uh, candidate models for ventral visual stream. <laughs>